Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, chronic daily migraine survivor, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and migraine strategist. I am here today on a special webcast. I'm here with Dr. Amy Galfond. She is the Director of Pediatric Headache at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. And I also have Dr. Don Buse, psychologist specializing in headache and board member of the American Headache Society. Thank you so much for being here. How are you guys? Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm happy to be here too. So our topic today, uh, we are going to talk about the effects of COVID, quarantine, all the changes that we have gone through on our adolescents and teens with headache disorders and migraine. Uh, changes are hard on those of us with a chronic illness as it is. Uh, and then we are having distance learning. We have lost the ability to do a lot of our activities that some of us may use as distraction techniques. We, um, we may be at home with family members who are well-meaning but maybe don't understand us and that could be a trigger. So we're gonna talk about a lot of those things today. And we're talking both to parents and to teens and adolescents themselves. So let's start off with Dr. Gelfon. I wanted to ask you, what changes have you noticed in the adolescent and teen population when it comes to migraine and these challenges? Are they doing better? Are they doing worse? Are they the same? I think it's been a bit of a mixed bag for some teens who I take care of. They have reported that they, they are feeling better, they are doing better, whereas for others, it's it's been more difficult and more challenging. For those who are doing better, some of the things that they've mentioned are um, more flexibility to their schedules. They don't have to get up as early necessarily. If they're joining school on Zoom or some other form of distance learning, they might be able to sleep in a little bit better. Maybe it's easier to eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. They don't have as many activities, so things aren't quite as hectic. Um, but for others, being on screens for such a prolonged period of time can be really difficult and, right. and the brightness of the screens can be really challenging. So I think it's, it's very individual, but I've certainly heard both ways. Right. I do. I have noticed it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Some people notice that there's fewer expectations and they're more comfortable in their home. And some people notice um, that they're missing some of the things that they used to use to cope. Uh, so some people might be feeling better. Some people might be feeling worse. Do you have any medical advice for the people that are feeling worse? What can they do for themselves? Well, um, certainly checking in with your provider to make sure that your, um, your preventive, if you're on a preventive treatment has been optimized, that your acute medicines have been optimized. And then in our program, we also have wonderful pediatric headache psychologists who have been working with our, our patients to help think about different techniques for managing the extra time on screens, whether it's right. taking little breaks, turning right. down the brightness, working out with the teachers to be able to turn your camera off when you need to, those types of techniques. Okay, so we often discuss on Heads Up, I know Dr. Buse and I have discussed this before, uh, how difficult it can be if you have family, friends, et cetera, who don't understand your headache disorder or your migraine disease. It can be really hard on you, whether you're an adult or a teen, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's something that you need to learn to cope with, it's very hard. Um, and so if you're now you know, spending way more time at home and you happen to have someone who is, is difficult. Maybe they are well-meaning and they do understand, or they, but they try too hard or, or something like that. It might be really hard for you. Um, and so I wanted to just address that because maybe it's a parent who's very well-meaning, but it just, it makes it difficult if you're spending a lot of time with them. So I wanted to address that. I mean, I'm a parent, we're all parents and we're all well-meaning, well but it doesn't mean we're always doing the right thing. So can we talk about that a little bit? Sure, um, that's a really important right. point. Like you said, Lindsay, we are all parents, all three of us. Right. I'm a parent of, of younger children um, doing virtual school. I'm an aunt of, of teenage a niece and nephew, and then three college age and, and post nephews. Right. And we want to remember that it is absolutely appropriate in the teenager, the adolescent's life journey to be 
becoming their own person. Right. This is the developmental time when they should be doing that. So when they're off in their school day, they have more independence and freedom than they did when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And they have the ability to, rightly or wrongly, however they do it, plan their own time, keep track of their own classes, their own homework, their own assignments, as well as make some of their own social plans. Mm -hmm. And what might be happening now is if your teen is back at home, if they're not doing in-person school, if they're in virtual school, now that whole day is spent with the parents and the family and parents may also be working from home or have brought in other people to help during this virtual school day and there's probably been a readjustment of social roles so one thing that's real important right now is to try to honor your teen's independence have him or her be the person making their own decisions about their time management and their scheduling and getting their homework done mm -hmm. and i'm a parent we always want to check in make sure it's done help them out but try as a parent to just take a breath stand back a little bit give them a little bit of space one good thing to remember is the whole world is going through this pandemic together and none of our kids will be left behind they are literally all in the same boat right. and teachers, administrators, everyone understands that. So now's the time to, I'm gonna say, lower our expectations a little bit on ourselves and our kids. Mm -hmm. Take a breath. Remember, this is a difficult, unusual, unprecedented time. Yes. And maybe just be a little bit easier on everybody. We also wanna always remember there are accommodations, as Dr. Gelfen mentioned, um, right. talk with teachers, principals, administrators about what your child needs. First off, try and have your child do it, your, your, your teenager do it, if he or she is able to have that conversation themselves with the teacher, the, the principal, whomever. Mm -hmm. They may not want as much screen time, may want some more downtime. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're not in a situation where you're comfortable with the video or audio on in the situation where the person is. And you have rights to talk about that. And we always want to have folks with migraine, be they students or adults advocating for their needs to be met. And there's all sorts of accommodations that can happen so that we have people with migraines succeeding at school or in the workplace. So don't forget, this is a different situation if you're doing virtual hybrid learning. You may need different accommodations, but your, your teenager has every right to accommodations. I think that's so important. I always tell parents to go ahead and go push for those accommodations, have the child advocate for themselves if they are able. Those accommodations were not available when I was young and had daily migraine. And oh my gosh, if I could have had them, it would have made a world of difference. So never be afraid to, to go for those accommodations. And I also tell parents that, you know, there's certain things I remember as a teenager with migraine, like as soon as I got out of bed from a horrible migraine, you know, I'd be going for the get to get some water, and the first thing that and my my poor mom, this is, but she was trying to help me. But the first thing she would say is, "Oh my gosh, you're better. You know, you have a calculus test tomorrow." Blah blah blah. If you jump on them right away, right in that postdrome period, they're going to be right back where they were. So it's always I always say, you know, be gentle with them right when they get out of bed. <laughs> so. Um, so when you're a teen dealing with migraine or another headache disorder, you know, social pressure is, is hard enough as it, as it is. It's hard to socialize. Often you can be a little depressed or, you know, you have to cancel plans. Uh, you okay. can't go out as often anyways. And I'm wondering from, from both of you, I'd like to hear if you've heard from the teens you work with, if they're having you know, if this, if this situation makes it easier on them socially, because maybe they're not expected to go out as much, or if it's harder because now they're more isolated. And if there's things, if you have any advice for them in this situation. Well, I, being at a tertiary pediatric headache program, I do take care of a, a lot of teens who have really uh, difficult chronic migraine. It's daily, it's continuous. They may not have been able to attend school regularly even before the pandemic and were missing so many activities and social interactions be even before the pandemic. And for some of them, they've actually found that this has been a, a great equalizer. Yeah. That now, instead of being so isolated from their peers, they can actually connect more because all of their peers are in the same in the same boat. Like Dr. We're all said. stuck at home. Yeah. Um, exactly. And so everyone's socializing online and not as much in person. And right. there aren't they maybe aren't missing their volleyball practice because volleyball is shut down. So in some ways it's it's 
I think helped some of our, our kids who were so cut off from, from regular life because now, unfortunately, everybody's been cut off in many ways from our regular lives. Right. Yeah. Those are really good points Dr. Gelfin makes. And sh as she mentioned, she cares for for young people who probably had the most frequent, maybe severe and refractory headache diseases, including migraine. Um, uh, more in the, in the folks who may, and that may be a lot of our listeners. You might be a parent of, of a child or a teenager with, with quite severe, quite frequent right. migraine disease or headache disease. Um, but more of the folks in the general population, it seems to be a mixed bag, exactly like Dr. Gelfand said. There are those who feel a bit of relief. They don't have the social pressures. Mm -hmm. There's not so much to miss and not so much to have to apologize for or miss out on. But there are also a lot of teens who are feeling really lonely and isolated. Mm -hmm. And the teenage years, again, one of the biggest developmental functions of a teenager is to have that social network that is part of individuating from your family of origin onto being an adult. Friends and peers are everything to teens and it's okay. That's what our brain is wired to do. And I think a lot of teens are really lonely and, and feeling isolated. Mm -hmm. um, it's common for people living with migraine to have some anxiety, some depression. Those are common. We say comorbidities, meaning conditions that happen more often than by chance. So it would not be surprising if your teen with migraine or other headache disease has some anxiety, has some depression, ever has panic attacks um, or other sorts of anxious sorts of symptoms. And the pandemic has has brought that out in a lot of people. It's either created some new feelings of anxiety and depression, or it's kind of heightened what was already existing. So this is a good time to think about things like mindfulness, relaxation exercises, yoga at home, um, as well as if your teen is really missing the social experiences, how can he or she connect safely? Right. Is it distanced in person? Is it um, using technology? What can be done safely? And consider just as important as academics are for your teens, their social and psychological functioning is really important. It's a big part of being a teenager and it's part of what they need. Right. I want to talk about change in routine a little bit. I think we all know that changes in routine are difficult on people with any chronic illness um, and, and with migraine, it's no different. And it seems to me like many of us, I know that our schools are opening and then closing, opening and then closing. And so it is, there is no routine. Um, so I wanted to see if you could, if you guys could speak to that a little bit, um, how our teens can deal with that, if that's something that they're facing. This is really creating for all of us the need to be incredibly flexible and resilient. As you mentioned, Lindsay, we all as humans really do well with routine. Mm -hmm. We also do well when we can predict what's coming. Right. And when there's a lot of unknowns during this pandemic, mm -hmm. things do change. Information's changing, regulations are changing, and right. school is changing. And that is hard on everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, dealing with unknowns is hard and something that we're all having to work on. Mm -hmm. But it really is a great skill. Mm -hmm. And successful people, be they teens or adults, have that psychological flexibility and resilience. And Lindsay, right. you and I did a whole podcast on resilience. Yes, it's a and good, the, you can go back and look at that resilience yeah. podcast. It was great. Sorry, go and ahead. And the definition of resilience is not that you're always up. It's you get knocked down and you get back up. Right. That's the definition of resilience. So the right. idea, like John Kabat-Zinn says, we can't stop the waves from coming, mm -hmm. but we can learn how to surf. Right. So this is a time for all of our teens and all of us to learn about navigating uncertainty and changing conditions because this will happen for the rest of their lives. Right. So it's a good time to find some of those resilient skills and practice some self-soothing, some calming. And a lot of it, all of us, we have to let it go. Mm -hmm. We have to let go of our expectations mm -hmm. and be a little easier on ourselves and our kids. Yes. Is that, that something so you've well noticed? Spoken. I cannot possibly <laughs> add to that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was going to ask you uh, if if you've noticed the the changes. If that's been a problem, if you've noticed uh, people's migraines getting worse with the uh, okay, I'm going back to school. Okay, now I'm not in school. If this has been a complaint, you've noticed. Sure. Well, one of the big things that's going to affect is sleep. And actually, Dr. Gelfand and her colleagues just published a study showing that for especially adolescents that that later school time is better for them. So, so teenagers naturally are later to rise and later to go to sleep. They're naturally phase delayed and it's part of being a teenager. So it just is. And so one thing that might be a silver lining might be with the at home virtual that someone might be getting more sleep. And even if they have a worsening or migraine attack during the day, they might be able to go back and, and lay down and get some sleep in the middle of the day. Right. But I'm imagining Dr. Gilfin, this change of schedule from home to back to school to home to back to school, has gotta be really rough on the circadian rhythm and migraine. Yeah, it's a lot of change. It's been hard on us and our family, yeah. just, you know, regular life, it's hard to have that much change. Um, I think that's really true. And um, teens do much better when they can go to sleep when it's physiologically timed for them, which is 11 p.m. or later often. And that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that middle schools and high schools begin no earlier than 8.30 a.m. so that they can still get ideally at least eight hours of sleep on a school night. However, only about 18 percent of high schools currently follow that recommendation. So we still have a lot of room to go. Um, one of the things that, that maybe some have had happen, which, which might help is since some schools are dividing the classes into halves and you get either the morning or the afternoon, I think there is some more opportunity to rest. Maybe it's, maybe it's to catch up on a nap or to just take a little bit of a break. So I think there are some silver linings to some of the, the schedule shifting, but um, overall, it, it, I think it's a negative not to be able to have a schedule that you can actually rely on. And I think it right. is a challenge yeah. that we're all having to hone our resilience skills right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, Dr. Gelfin, you remind me that people are, some districts are doing half and half. And if you have that, I think as a parent or a student, ask for the afternoon. And if the school does not grant you the afternoon, get a doctor's note. We love writing those notes. We will write a note for you. <laughs> yeah. That is a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we need to keep bringing up to, to keep your doctor in the loop and, and to get those notes when there is something like that, like maybe you can go to school in the afternoon. It's such a good point. So the last question I just wanted to bring up is that there have been reports of, I mean, everyone, these kids seem to be suffering higher levels of stress. And a lot of it, we haven't brought up the fact that a lot of it's just coming from um, the, it's harder to keep your grades up. It, the application process to college is stranger now. They're doing all these things and there's no precedent for it because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not what it was when the kids before them did it. Um, can you just basically just talk about how they can bring their stress levels down? Just talk about that really quick. Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that we're all going through this together. So mm -hmm. the entire cohort, the entire, you know, graduating class in the United States of America is going through the same thing, yep. um, let alone around the world. Yep. And so we want to try to keep that in mind. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of kids who are working so hard towards getting good grades, getting right. into all good colleges, um, all these standardized tests, and we know that 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 those stressors can exacerbate migraine and yeah. increase numbers of headache attacks, either during the times of stress or after the times of stress. But this is really a time when we're going to have to breathe, change our standards a little bit, and realize we're all in the same boat. So it's not that anyone else is getting ahead. We are all going through this together and administrators, colleges, teachers, future employers, everyone will know that this was during the pandemic and yeah. everyone will have different expectations for this time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that, that both teens and their parents who might have a lot of pressure and worries and anxieties about this achievement should try to help calm themselves and relax themselves and remember this is just a different unique time and the way that our kids are judged and their future opportunities this will be considered it will be taken right. into consideration 
Right. And Dr. Gelfon, can you talk about how important it is to control your stress level when you are someone with a chronic illness like migraine? I, I think it's one of those things where um, with, with any illness, stress can make things worse and, and having an illness, a chronic illness is stressful in and of itself. And so I think there's, there's a lot of um, feed forward loops there. And for me, having such a big interest in sleep, it comes back to that every time because when we're, when we're under more stress or experiencing more anxiety, it's more difficult to fall asleep. It might be more difficult to stay asleep and, and get adequate sleep. And our brains can regulate our emotions much better if we've had a good night of sleep. Exactly. So, you know, what can we do to try to optimize sleep? Um, I always encourage teens to try to avoid using devices in the hour or two before bedtime, or at least put the blue light filter or blue light filtering lenses because um, all of our brains, but particularly teenage brains are sensitive to blue light. It suppresses mm -hmm. the body's, the brain's release of melatonin, one of the hormones that helps us fall asleep. So for, mm -hmm. particularly for the hour or two right before bedtime, really trying to minimize that, having some kind of winding down routine for 20 minutes that helps our brains are so busy, 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 and they can't just go straight to, to resting time. There needs to be a little bit of a winding down transition, keeping the room dark, keeping the room cool, um, those types of basic things, but, but really important for trying to get good sleep. Right. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you guys would like to add to our topic of teens and migraine during the time of COVID? I just really liked Dr. Buse's emphasis on um, everybody's going through this together. Everybody, let's all lower our expectations. Right. I think everyone will recognize that 2020 and probably much of 2021 will have a relative gap in, in everybody's productivity. And I think yes. that if we collectively accept that that's, that's happening, then we don't have to be quite so wound up about it. I loved your... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Buse, is there anything you'd like to add? I agree. Just keep breathing and we will get through this together and it really will be okay. So exactly what Dr. Gelfand said, we need to give our team some space, let them do their thing, let them be social safely if that's what they're feeling, mm -hmm. let them be at home being cozy, comfy and resting, sleeping, um, downtime if that's what they're feeling mm -hmm. and kind of just get through whatever way feels natural and feels best and we will get to the other side of this and in fact someone may be listening to this in the future who already is on the other side of this so yes. it'll come we'll get through it together just be gentle to ourselves and gentle to each other yes well thank you so much dr buse and dr gelfond and thank you everyone for joining us on this week's episode of heads up the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation.